You are listening to the API The Docs podcast. We are here to talk about API documentation upstream and downstream. I think the benefit that Develop Advocate brings to the integrators is that constant insight from the users, that constant source of feedback, which is aggregated. You don't need to go through the 10 different channels we have and try to read every message to find the right that's related to doc. There's a single place of truth when you can find all the insights. And on the other side, the Rob Advocate are really good at writing. They are really this educational uh, DNA. So when they write something, I'm very proud of the team because I really feel they know how to teach. But tech writers, what they bring is to make sure what we write is consistent and the quality is there and we're using the same way of writing. So the way we work now, the developer advocates, we have a support roster. Every week, one of the developer advocates is on support. That person is in charge of answering questions from the community on the community forum, is responsible if animating and answering the things that are happening in the community in Discord and running like office hours. That person is in charge of helping the customer support team when there's an escalation. And that person is in charge of logging all the insights they see during that week. And that kind of the other week on Friday, you end up with product board, like a list of insights that are not clean and they are not categorized. So by the end of the week, the developer advocate that is in charge of the support goes through that list of insights and clean them. When I talk, I try to be clear and accurate because I have learned to value people's time more, especially when our users, so our target audience comes to the docs, uh, they are quite likely a bit frustrated because they've tried to do something and that didn't work out. They're getting a little bit impatient because they would really like to move on and get their POC, for example, up and running. So we don't have time to do small talk. We don't have time to have an icebreaker. We don't have time to be funny. Uh, with words, at least, um, we just we just need to say as little as possible to get them out of the woods. That's it. That's the best service we can do. Hello, and welcome to the API The Docs podcast. I am Laura Vash, and my co-host is Anat Pojar. We split our interview into two parts. You are now listening to part two. Iro is uh, the well-loved and well-known visual collaboration tool. And today, uh, here, we are conversing with Anthony Rue, who is Developer Relations Lead at Miro, Mira Balani, who is Senior Technical Writer at Miro, and Marco Spinello, who is also a Senior Technical Writer at Miro. In part one, if you're interested, we talked about how they joined their teams, what they learned since then, how and by whom their developer docs came to be as they are today, and, well, what happens when two tech writers actually disagree. So this is part two of our conversation. And uh, in this, we go deeper into how their respective teams complement each other. We will also get a detailed narrative from Anthony about uh, their process to aggregate all types of feedback, whether it's a feature request, bugs, or documentation improvements into one central database. So Debra and the tech writer team working together, what they can learn from each other during this journey or process. I think one of the most important things that allow us to learn from each other is we really challenge each other, you know. So challenging, um, for example, for the quick start guide, challenging each other on, okay, do we really need to have different pages for this? Should we just have one long page with different steps or different sections? Um, actually different DevRel advocates performing different steps in there and providing the feedback to us or challenging us on what should be the next step, what should be the previous step, or what should be the topic after this. So I think that helps us um, learn from each other a lot. And then providing the feedback. And I think also the knowledge sharing that occurs between this um, different teams really, really help in learning. Mm-hmm. Uh, Marco and Anthony, would you like to add to this? Um, yes, thank you, Mida. Uh, I yeah, I, I think that what developer relations uh, give back to tech writers is really um, they're so close to develop, to to our audience and they understand it extremely well because they they have the same background and they they think in a similar they, the, they have a similar mindset so they really help us stay tuned um to our audience uh, for me that's the that's the biggest advantage the biggest benefit that i get from it um and 
if I, if I want to approach our users directly, I can first ask them uh, what's the best thing to do, uh, or I can ask them, for example, um, hey, do you have? Did you see any feedback about this specific feature, or this specific issue that we had in the past, and did we manage to solve it? Um, yeah, they, they are they are like having you know um, a preferential lane at the at the airport, like a premium at Schiphol. Yeah, uh, I like what you're saying, Marco. I think the benefit that Develop Advocate brings to the tech writers is that constant insight from the users, that constant source of feedback, which is aggregated. You don't need to go through the 10 different channels we have and try to read every message to find the line that's related to doc. There's a single place of truth when you can find all the insights. They can develop advocate to give us all the good, in, a good insights about the prioritization. Tech writers have millions of things to write and they cannot do everything, right? You have a limited uh, bandwidth and you need to manage your prioritization. Because we talk to customers all the time, to developers, we know exactly what's the highest priority and what is maybe not that important. And we can help uh, them to prioritize what has the highest impact or not. And on the other side, the Rob Advocate are really good at writing. They are really this educational uh, DNA. So when they write something, I'm very proud of the team because I really feel they know how to teach. But tech writers, what they bring is to make sure what we write is consistent and the quality is there and we're using the same way of writing. So whatever documentation you open, whatever it's one component, another component, whatever it's a high level, high level guide or low level guide, it's always using exactly the same voice and tone, the same um, type of writing. So when you read, if someone is learning, they're not going to feel they're reading from two different persons. And that's what the tech writers bring. And they help as well the developer advocates to learn to write better, which is a very important part of our job. Um, but the way I see it, at least from my point of view, this is the two, like we can give them good insights on what they should work on and how to improve. And they can make sure that whatever we do has the quality needed and the consistency between the different type of docs. What is allowing you to uh, have this freedom and autonomy in your cooperation? Is that some sort of special time tracking or incentive? Or how does the throw it over the hedge and let the other solve it not happen with your two teams? Do you see something that's like, okay, that's the edge, but don't go there because then this kind of cooperation is going to stop? No, there's nothing particular that I can think of. Um, You're just overall awesome people. That's it. Uh, yeah, it just boils down to <laughs> that. Yeah, they're really cool guys, uh, nice people, very team oriented, collaborative. Mm -hmm. I think also being very open-minded and open to feedback is very important here. I'll give one example. And the thing is, when you're open to feedback, right, you take it constructively. There was one incident when um, Addison, one of our DevRel advocates, um, messaged me and said, hey, Mira, don't you, why do we have that line at the top of our dev portal? I'm like, hey, you know what? Good question. I always, I I didn't like that so much, but I never had the time to really look into it. But now that someone else is saying about this, I'm going to look into it. And let's check with our design team, with the developers, if they can customize and take it out so it looks better. And let's also check with other people what they think about it. And then we actually came to a conclusion that that line can be removed and it looks much better now, things like that. So I think like it's really about being open and um taking, like I said, working towards that one goal of providing the best experience that you can to your developers that we all think about. We step aside, we don't look at individualities and we just look at what would be the best that we can put out there. I think that's what really makes it work. And really, everybody's just so awesome. Everybody just tries their best. They're so passionate about what they're doing that it really helps us work together efficiently. Yeah. <laughs> Can we put some numbers to this? So, um, like really roughly, how many developer users are we talking about? And Anthony, you mentioned you aggregate the feedback. And I have a big idea that, that it's not as easy as it sounds. No, it's not. Uh, number of users today. So we launched the new platform two months ago. So the number of users is on the new version. It, it, stating of it is still quite low. We're talking to a couple of uh, hundred uh, closer to a thousand, if we talk about active uh, users. We used to have quite a few active customers on the ver previous version, but now we're slowly migrating to the new version. Uh, and that we're talking, talking about a couple of thousand uh, active developers on the platform. So still not a huge product, but growing. Um, the question about the insight, yes, that's not as easy. And it took us quite a lot of time to get more mature on that. I think we're reaching a point where we're doing better. 
when I joined, we didn't really have a process or a proper tooling helping us to collect the insights. And there's a lot of channels. We have our internal Slack and we have a lot of teams customer facing. We have the customer success management team. We have the solution engineering team, uh, the account manager. They're talking to customers daily. This source of insight was almost lost. It was on hundreds of different Slack channels and no one was really saving them. Then we have the community forum. We have the support channels. We receive support by email. We have as well, we used to have a Slack community that is now a Discord community. And all these conversations were not saved anywhere. So we adopted a tool. We use Product Board um, as a tooling, which is our central source of collecting insight. And what's a really good for us about Product Board, the list of integrations they have, they have a Slack integration. So you can on one click from a Slack chat, send it into a mailbox in Product Board. They have a Chrome plugin from any website. You can just highlight the piece of insights or the feedback and send it to Product Board. So the way we work now, the developer advocates we have a support roster. Every week, one of the developer advocates is on support. That person is in charge of answering questions from the community on the community forum, is responsible if animating and answering the things that are happening in the community in Discord and running like office hours. That person is in charge of helping the customer support team when there's an escalation. And that person is in charge of logging all the insight they see during that week. And that kind of the other week on Friday, you end up with product board, like a list of insights that are not clean and they are not categorized. So by the end of the week, the developer advocate that is in charge of the support goes through that list of insights and clean them. It's like write some of them to make it clearer. And product guard is a feature when you can assign uh, you can assign an insight to a feature request or a bug. So that's what we do. At the end of the week, we go through all the list of insights we collected and we categorize them. These five insights were for a new feature. We put them together into the feature and we add a way for the request, depending if it's a, a big partner, depending if it's a big customer, depending if it's a, a request we have seen only one. And then we have a second view for the product managers. Now they have an aggregated version of all the future requests we get with the weight for uh, them. We call it a user uh, impact score. And they have the source of feedback for every single feedback we get. So if they want to get a the context, they can click, oh, this was asked on the community forum. And they're the link to open the page on the community forum and read the full thread. And that's how we work with the product managers to prioritize basically what comes from the, from the users. We use that as well for bug because it gives us a single source of truth for all the open bugs and it helps us to close the feedback loop. So when something is developed, we can go back to the, to the user that requested it and we can tell them that it's been deployed. We use that as well to do beta testing. Uh, people, a lot of people are asking for a feature. If we had a first draft, maybe a design document, we contact them, hey, you were asking for that feature. This is the design document. Does it answer your need? Is that what you're looking for? And we can have this constant conversation uh, ongoing. And we do that for all type of feedback, whatever it's feature requests, bugs, documentation improvement, or um, yeah, I guess this will be the three categories. Um, that tool being central helped us a lot. And we actually leverage even another feature. They have, you can build a roadmap in that tool and you can make it public. So if you go to our developer portal, you will see that we have a public roadmap when you can see what's in our backlog, what's in under development, what has been delivered, and our users can vote directly for the feature they, they are looking for. And that automatically links it to the right feature in our list. So we even collect more insights and we're able to close that feedback loop. Or they can request new features that will send it to that tool. And now the fact that we started using that about nine months ago, primarily was only developer advocates and a few product managers. And this is scaling now. Uh, a lot of people in the platform now use that as basically their source of uh, truth for any uh, insight, to know what to work on or to understand what the problem are or how people are seeing or using our product. And that allows us uh, to share that knowledge that was before scattered in many, many different channels into one place. So on our side, it's a bit heavy. And obviously, the more users we have, the more time that's going to request. That's why now we're working educating some other functions in the company, like the one that are talking to customer every day, to do that so we don't have to do it. And that scales better. Uh, the tool as well is a bit uh, it's adopted by other functions, not only us in the platform. So that will help because we're going to be able to pass each other insights between the different mirrors products. But yeah, that's how we have been doing it. And I see a drastic change, if you ask me, about nine months ago when we were trying to guess what was the most important thing requested by developers, by users, and now that we have literally metrics. And then later on, you can link that uh, to maybe your sprint, so you know how much impact score you deliver per sprint if you wanted to calculate that. If we, our platform is free of charge, but if we're charging, we could even calculate the how much money uh, that brings, we calculate how much a feature could bring potentially in the future. There's a lot of things we could do like this. For the moment, we keep it simple because we just want to increase the adoption of the, the tool and the process. But um, yeah, that's how we do it.
it was super insightful to see you break it down because I was uh, looking at especially the roadmap on Miro developers and uh, I was curious how feature requests made their way to that uh, page and, and that was the answer. Yeah, y yes or and no. Partly. So, partially. We don't have an automatic process. If someone requests something, it doesn't appear right away on the roadmap. Uh, we do the work. So every week, developer advocate, each developer advocate works on uh, specializing in specific part of the product. Uh, Addison will be working with Marco on the web SDK, our UI library. Um, Will will be working on the REST API with Mira. Um, Joanna will be working on another component with Boris. That's how we do it. So every week they sit with the product manager in charge of the product and they review the roadmap to make sure it's up to date. Uh, but we're the one doing the work and rewriting the cards, what we call the cards that you can see on the roadmap, just because it has to be very clear. And sometimes when a user requests something, it's not really clear for everybody what they mean. So we do that work of aggregating, cleaning it, rewriting it, and putting it there, and maintaining the status between the different stages. And the documentation on the Miro developer site is really impressive and comprehensive. Um, you even have video tutorials, which I think uh, cumbersome to maintain, uh, or I can imagine. And yeah, you have SDK and API documentation and many quick start uh, guides. And I really adore that you, yeah, the dog fooding that you use the visualization of the mirror board and your tools. And actually I was happy seeing uh, in many visualization tools and representation in developer docs because I'm, I'm on that side that uh, yes, even technical and developer people need uh, guidance. And yeah, it's, it's easier to get familiar with the new process and the workflow and the new tool when we can actually see the UI. And the, so it's, it's a, uh, it's um, it's just useful. Can you tell us about how this this comprehensive documentation were born? What was the first step, or um, what teams contributed to it? I think the first step was a typo, and then we fixed it. <laughs> it's always that. <laughs> yeah, always a typo. Yes, <laughs> get it immediately out of the system, and then move on. Uh, Mira, I think you can tell this story because you were here first. Okay, yeah, um, it's actually really evolved so much and there's so much I can say about this, but I'll try my best to make it like as short as possible. So I think we really started with first updating just the V1 docs because we were working on the V2 product and um, ha keeping in mind that we do not want to put in so much effort into V1 because we know that we're facing that out, focusing more on V2. Um, looking at the user journey. Um, and that was like, of course, with the time constraints and different constraints that we had, whatever we could do best. Um, making, I think then we came up with the information, looking at what the user journey is and then what the product is and then combining that and coming up with an information architecture. Um, I remember we started with Google Docs, we moved it to Miro board, and uh, it was an amazing experience even doing that. And when I say that we're doing these different things, it involves all the teams, not just the technical writing team. So it involves engineering, DevRel, product management, QA, support. Um, so it's, it's a lot of uh, different teams, different input, different feedback that what you see now is a product of all of this, and which is what I think makes it really powerful and really standing out there because of this kind of collaboration that we had. And um, at that time, we were all working from home. Now we're working in a hybrid mod model, so it's a bit easier. Um, but yes, there, we had our own challenges as well because also... Uh, we have to keep in mind that we have a lot of new people joining in, a lot of people still learning, a lot of people onboarding. How do we make it um, very productive for everyone? So we started that way. We looked at this and then we kept iterating. We kept improving. Um, the information architecture we had earlier was so different from what you see now also. Um, and so we kept doing that, uh, getting feedback uh, also. I think it would not have been possible, really. I 
mean every word when I say this without the Debrel team. Because if you see the portal, it looks like one tone and voice, but a lot of it has also come from the Debrel team. Like, for example, Joanna created a migration guide. Addison created a lot of how-tos. Will has created a lot of how-tos as well. They create the sample apps, which is very important for our users as well. So um, a lot of collaboration there. And I think that's been the journey. And what we do is we still keep challenging, keep challenging, keep challenging, keep improving, try to see what we can do better. Um, in fact, just a few days back, we had a workshop where we are now again revisiting the user journey, um, where we have more people, more input from different um, teams. And we're going to see what we can do better. How can we level up this level that we've come to? So I think keeping that goal of providing uh, what we need to, given the constraints that we have and given the delivery timelines and keeping on iterating on that and making it better uh, day by day, month per month. Uh, I think that's what uh, we've been doing so far. So it's a lot that has come into this different, um, the different phases have a lot involved in them, but this is the summary that I can give. And then I would probably want Anthony and Marco to also pitch in and add more specifics to these different phases that I mentioned. Or if I missed anything, please feel free to add to that as well. Yeah, I can add a bit of on the tooling we use and the challenges we're facing as well. Um, we launched a new, a new portal and documentation about two months ago. The feedback has been pretty good, but we are as well very aware about the challenges we, we have and things we need to solve and improve. The first one you mentioned is the developer journey. Because we have three different products, they can be used totally independently, but they can be used together as well. It's pretty difficult to build good onboarding, uh, onboarding journeys, just because it's very hard to predict what onboarding journey is the best or what the developer is going to look next. So if you look at a set of documentation, isolated, they are very good pieces of content. But the full onboarding journey for the moment a developer lands on our poll until the moment they finish to develop their app is not always consistent. And we really need, that's why the workshop we had this week, we're trying really to define a different onboarding journey for different persona and be able to customize and make their experience uh, really good, to always know what comes next, to always to give them that feeling that we keep their hands all the way on the learning process until the app is developed. And that's something we really need to improve. The other, the background story of why we decided to go for readme.io as a, as a portal or a tooling is because when we started, things were very small and we didn't have the, the capacity to build. And we decided to go for something which was out of the box. That brings some very good, uh, some very positive things. We don't need to care about hosting. Uh, some toolings come out of the box with the open API specification, uh, automatic connections, but some other all limitations because when you build, when you buy a product out of the box instead of building it, it doesn't feel it doesn't fit some of your constraints. One of them is we have a REST API documentation, but we have a web SDK, which is a very, very different type of documentation. And readme doesn't always allow the flexibility we're hoping for that to build exactly the user journey we want, or even the visual way of the documentation. So we're trying to find what's the best way to customize it or to tweak it in a way that it improves the developer journey and overall the documentation. Um, but this is some of the challenges we're facing now and that we we're working on it. We really need to solve it. We really want that to be a great uh, developer journey. As a, a bit of a closure, but this is actually my favorite question always. Um, what are the latest skills or perspectives, uh, ways of thinking, or even tools that you've been picking up recently? And, and most especially what was like, not really part of course, but like surprisingly helpful. I think really learning the product itself, number one, um, learning the technology. So for example, um, the code, because that's where you need to review, update uh, what the developers have written. How do you navigate through that code? You need to understand that part. And then JavaScript, which is another part because we have the front end part of it, which is the SDK. I think the number one key thing that enabled us to provide this kind of content where we are now, and uh, I'm not saying it's the best there out there, uh, but we are iterating it. And But to this level, what we have was also very challenging. Uh, what really allowed that was collaboration. So intense collaboration between cross-functional teams, feedback, 
and uh, keeping that open mind and ensuring that every feedback was looked into, addressed, and closed. You know, that's also very important because that also shows the person who provides the feedback that you value their feedback and something was done about it. You know, so I think these are the key things that I want to share. And uh, I'll pass it on to Marco. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Mida. The key thing for me as well, uh, learning JavaScript, uh, and this time modern JavaScript, no, pre-ES6, uh, um, which, which is something that uh, I am I'm doing, so that is an ongoing effort, learning to use TypeDoc and learning how it works. Uh, it, it has a it has a couple of quirks because of course we wanted to use readme so you you need to get acquainted with those as well. Those are the two the two things that for me were things that I had to um, to pick up from scratch pretty much because I didn't know anything about that. Now we are uh, exploring other things. So there's also a, a little bit when when I have like five or ten minutes that I'm either bored or waiting for a task to complete. I go out and shop around a little bit to see what others are doing, what kind of technologies they're doing. If there's something interesting that we could learn or that we could uh, take and get inspiration from. Um, so um, yeah, that, that depends. Some days are like fishing. You don't, you don't, it's a terrible catch. And some other days you find an amazing blog post or an amazing podcast uh, that really opens up uh, new possibilities, new options for you. And outside of technical writing? Is there something that like surprisingly spiraled back into your writer work as a technical writer? Like how? Like how? Um, so for my experience, um, it came from a personal need to learn nonviolent communication, but it became an awareness that now covers all of my professional activities, and I didn't expect to to become such a different communicator because of that. But in retrospective, I would say, thank God that I bumped into that because it was really helpful. When I talk, I try to be clear and accurate because I have learned to value people's time more, um, especially when our users, so our target audience comes to the docs, uh, they are quite likely a bit frustrated because they've tried to do something and that didn't work out. Um, they're getting a little bit impatient because they would really like to move on. Uh, and get their POC, for example, up and running. Uh, so we we don't really we don't have time to to do small talk. We don't have time to 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 have an icebreaker, and um, we don't have time to be funny uh, with words. At least um, we just we just need to say as little as possible to get them out of the woods. That's it. That's the best service we can we can do. Um, I do put small Easter eggs in the docs, though. They're unobtrusive. Uh, you, can, you can totally skip them. And usually if you find them, people say, oh, you put an Easter egg there. I say, of course. I only saw something like a very yellow star, and it made me smile. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that counts. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, do you have anything? Uh, do, do you have anything that you would add to this? No, I think your answer were, were very, very good. Uh, my world has changed a lot over the last years. I used to be the one picking up any new framework and trying everything. Uh, I have much less time to do that lately. But it's funny mm -hmm. because I, I have a similar answer where, where I have a bit of time still trying to pick up some JavaScript skills, which definitely not my strong point. But a lot of my work now is to enable other people to have the right environment to do the, the best work and making sure the teams are communicating between each other, that they have a psychological safe environment, uh, and basically unlocking the collaboration between the teams. And that's what I spend most of my time uh, doing right now. Uh, much less involved as well in day-to-day. -day. Uh, I haven't wrote in quite a long time that I used to love. Uh, so I'm very happy when someone contacts me and I can join a podcast or something. I can do still a bit of the private advocacy and talk. Uh, but yeah, much more work on the background and letting the teams uh, and team member uh, have the front end, the front path. Uh, they are very good. I'm very happy with the team we've built so far. But yeah, mm -hmm. I guess at some point that's part of the role to step back a bit and uh, letting other people do what they are very good at. Thank you so much. And thank you for being here then. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much us. for giving us this opportunity to share our learnings and the experience we've had. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And uh, I hope uh, there was also insights for uh, the listeners great. Uh, to take away. Yeah. And thank you so much for the questions. 
interesting and uh, mindful to the point. Uh, relevant, really. Uh, thank you very much. Nice questions. <laughs> And so, uh, well, while we're talking, we also have video feed. And um, as a goodbye, we just saw Anthony's cat and Marco also had a cat. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there were more uh, in this call than you knew. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And see you soon at API at the DOS or any other conference, uh, virtually or not. And I hope to meet again because I actually started also to too. appreciate very much on our recurring guests and following up uh, on the journey, both from uh, personal professional insights uh, evolution and from uh, teams of a, of a product or a company, that kind mm -hmm. of evolution, I, I find that riveting. So I would love to see you back uh, sometime later again. Thank you so much. We'd love to join, out, to join again. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Annette. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a nice Have day. Have a nice day. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. Thanks again to our guests, to Pronovix for letting us work on this, and the entire API The Docs community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website apidocs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API The Docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.